Okay. 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 I'm already on the already on the picture. So, okay. Maurice welcome from the University of Ad, uh, Edinburgh and Edinburgh Care Cancer Care Western General. His research interest is computer based diagnosis is implementation in the sense he has developed implementation prototypes and technologies for biomedical, aerospace, and biotechnological application. The title of his presentation is Learn CT Analysis Using 3D uh, Disparity Red Light Block Mapping for Theopathy Abrasive Body Radi uh, Radiotherapy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Yes. And so this is more like a continuation of my research. And so uh, first and foremost, I started with to, uh, how to establish a relationship between two scans. Say, for instance, say uh, a planning CT and followed by the on the day of treatment CT. And this is how I started my uh, PhD. And then uh, the research question, what we wanted to do is how to improve the clinical workflow on the whole, and also in the meantime, to reduce the uh, toxic, uh, you know, the toxication, therapeutic radiation toxicity. So in that sense, I, uh, I was working with the uh, two scans altogether. The idea is to, uh, to establish the geometrical changes between two scans. So these scans, uh, when I say these scans were all from the soft tissues and the soft tissues do have the tendency of, they are not being rigid. So when they are using an elastic deformation or elastic registration, they all resulted in the unrealistic, unnatural deformation. And that's where I came up with the idea of regularizing on the fly and localizing the block matching. And that's where I introduced the distance-based regularization and the neighborhood vector orientation-based uh, regularization. So having published that work, then came the questions, okay, what next? So now I have two scans and able to relate them geometrically and able to come up with the, dis uh, you know, the displacement vector field, characterize the geometrical changes. But what if my scans had large coarser, coarser regions like that of the lung CT? Is that helpful? Because for instance, in stereotactic, stereotactic adaptive body radiotherapy, they were much more focused on follow-ups. For instance, they are much more concerned on the onset of the pulmonary fibrosis. So how to characterize that? And that was the question they asked me, okay, you now have a method. Do you think you could use that method to characterize these changes for the uh, radiographers and the oncologists, they have the lung as a total volumetric, lung volumetric changes to quantify their pulmonary fibrosis. So in that sense, I thought, okay, I have a block matching technique that uses the mean absolute error to find a similar block and restrain them using this regularization. I have a very good multi-pass techniques but how can I use the texture information? So when I was trying to use the mutual information as a uh, image similarity metrics or cross correlation, when the block size is too small, how we actually try to understand the variance because texture is the measurement of the variations. And then I thought, <clears throat> why don't I use the texture maps? So we have the you know the uh, range as uh, we have textual filters already, range filters, entropy filters, standard deviation filters. So instead of trying to do a block matching technique between two scans, why not you in, you know why not use a filter, have different texture maps, and try to apply the block matching techniques on them as well, and include them as a voxel intensity, uh, include them in the uh, voxel intensity based block matching as well. So after, so when I just saw that, okay, this looks good. This sounds, looks promising because we have different types of, uh, you know, textures. For instance, we have a smoother regions and we have the emphasis of the edges and the 
structures and a coarser region as well. So we have two, three different uh, texture maps. And then I use them in the block matching, uh, in the in, in three dimensional block matching technique. So I had three different, more like four different uh, search spaces, for instance. So I have voxel intensity based search space and three different texture map based uh, search spaces. And then applied the block matching technique on all of them and regularize them. So this morning we were actually talking about how tough to do a hyperparameter turning because when people talk about the block matching immediately they think about the zero to 255 image commonly available images them using them for other techniques. But when it comes to medical images, you can't use reuse as such. That's where the hyperparameter optimization actually helped me. So in this case, I normalized them in a way so that it could be used and reused in other uh, applications as well. So my cost functions were all tuned to certain range as in, uh, in this case, it's more like in CT values. That's where I have normalized. So zero to 4,000. And this normalization I have used in uh, image in synthesis as well in, uh, in image synthesis using cycle GANs as well. So that's where I targeted normalizing the cost function. Once that is done, it was able, I was able to translate the DBLM into an extended DBLM. So in the DBLM method, I was just using the slices into uh, slice to multiple slices comparison, whereas in the extended, extended DBLM, I was able to use the texture maps as well. So at each slice location, I was able to able to estimate the uh, the vector field, displacement vector field, and and that helped me to characterize the geometrical changes between two different scans. Okay, what uh, fact, what I'm actually talking about. So when they when we talk about the displacement vector field, this is really what happens in between the scans. In all these locations, you know the the places that I have marked, there are specific sites to bring to an attention that these are the sites or to it's more like this the, the region D, J, G, P, and M, they're all in the part of the sternum. And we have the uh, we have the uh, the arteries and we have the lungs and so on and so forth to to give an idea. This is where all it starts. This is where the you know the displacements have been detected. So these are the origins of object displacements. And then when we combine together, this is what we are estimating at each slices. In the, the first slice, you could see, you know, in the background and the foreground, in this case, the background is more like non-anatomical part is the background and the foreground is the anatomical part. We could see how the displacement vector field or the motion vectors in this sense have actually displaced or moved or generated a motion compensated slice. But that's not the end of the story because it was able to describe, okay, this has happened in the slice. But is that does this give a clinical significance for the clinicians to actually see, okay, what's really gonna be there? And that's where the bias DVF has come. So once I estimated the motion vector, so this is the co contrast between the DBLM I proposed in 2021 and in the 2022, I am I have proposed I'm proposing the bias D DVF where I am utilizing the voxel intensities and just multiplying them and, and making a product of the magnitude of the motion vectors to give them the emphasis saying that that is a pulmonary fibrosis and nothing has happened in the sternum. And you have to look something over there. And then to, you know, to parametrically quantify, I use the standard uh, metrics like structural similarity index and normalized mean square error and peak signal noise to ratio. And it all just says the story how the geometrical displacements, the estimated ge ge geometrical displacements are closer to the actual movements of the organs. So, so far we, I have been talking about the displacement, vector field, motion vectors, block matching, but in reality, the organs have 
mood and on the day of treatment they can use that relation to change the treatment plan that is the clinical significance when it comes to radiotherapy adaptive radiotherapy in this case it characterizes the pulmonary fibrosis okay so i have done a technique that uh, uh, does does the geometrical characterization you know that's good that it is able to emphasize the pulmonary fibrosis good well enough but is that okay because they already have you know the clinicians they already do a mean you know image absolute uh, error you know the the difference voxel difference between two image slices and they 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 said i already have this why do i need to see uh, you know the emphasis in this what's the emphasis in this so the emphasis in this point is so far when it comes to quantification of the pulmonary fibrosis they have to rely on the total volumetric changes it is similar to the die score where you know they try to see things or in a an aggregated fashion but in this case not only it highlights the location that they have to look into it they were able to characterize the volumetric change as shape changes as well now that is a key clinical significance or the key thing that they that helps them to look more into it not only it actually able uh, you know highlight it's more like she, she says that there is something has occurred in that site, but gives a nudge to the clinicians. Hmm, you have to look into that. It's something odd. Is this right? So that's why uh, I am proposing like computer assisted uh, geometrical, it's well, computer assisted anatomic uh, anom anomaly detection method that uses the texture map. So on a conclusion, sorry, excuse me. So on a conclusion, what I am proposing is, let's use texture maps. It may be, you know, it may be already available texture map or much more, find the suitable, suitable texture maps for the regions for the scans that has, you, you know, large texture or large coarser regions, use them as a image similarity metrics, and then use the, two pass distance and orientation based regularization for block matching. In this case, I chose block matching for its simplicity, but when we are applying the anatomical constraints in other rigid, uh, non rigid registrations, it could improve as well because that's what I'm proposing. I wasn't, I'm not saying that block matching is best and it out, out, outperformed the other techniques. The, the point I'm trying to emphasize is when you include the regularization techniques, in a you know a regular technique that uses the anatomical constraint in an elastic registration that improves its performance. That's what I'm emphasizing here. And overall, it helps the clinicians to you know find the early onset of the pulmonary fibrosis because that's what the motion vector that's what the displacement vector does. It finds the even slightest geometrical change between two scans. Thank you. Thank you for a very wonderful presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes. So if you are talking about the, you know, uh, I've checked with the CT and CBCT. So it's more like uh, once the CBCT is being synthesized. So yeah, it, it works. Uh, uh, unfortunately, no, because my data set is more like it comes under, it's not in a public domain data set. It was like a protected, protected data set provided by the NHS. So I actually did not try with the different hardwares, but should that be a problem? Now that is a very interesting question because I have tuned my cost function. So it's more like it is more based on the cost function. That's where the key changes. So if you are able to, you know, bring the data representation in that range, then I'm certain that you could use that because, because this works in CT and CBCT, but in different context. I have a similar question actually. Yeah. But uh, a little bit different. Is it, uh, 
I see that uh, you are measuring volumetric changes. Volumetric. So you said that uh, that can be connected to the sort of behaviors. So I am not doing the volumetric changes. I am trying to I am trying to find the geometrical changes. Yeah, okay. that's that's what I'm connecting. Okay. So uh, what uh, what I'm curious and also my work is uh, uh, related to these troubles and also to maybe present uh, from the side of the data and what here happens. And colleague already said, if we have a different center, if we if, if we differently, uh, uh, let's say, define as a colleague, you might, with the same patient, you may receive different pictures. Yes. And then if these pictures or images are uh, supplied to you as an image, with a, uh, and only in a format image form, mm -hmm. so they are not associated with the diaphragm standardization, Mm -hmm. then you can be mislead in all your uh, uh, research. Yeah. And I'm trying to, uh, to uh, persuade all, uh, uh, let's say, colleagues to look a little bit back how did we define this picture and how did we define this geometry of the human body on the death machine mm -hmm. before we talk about what we can see on the picture when we see it. I will look into it, certainly. Yeah, sure. But uh, I just wanted to add it into that. So when you talk about the different hardware, let's say we are trying to relate a CT scan and a CBC, CBCT scan. And I would certainly agree that CBCT is a different imaging modality and CT is different. So how I, have, uh, I solved that particular problem is I chose the uh, you know, domain invariant feature representation of the images. So I use the pseudo it's more like I use the image synthesis approach and change the CBCT into a pseudo CBCT and then apply the DBLM. So that is how I solve that problem. Not into a geometric, you know, but uh, what I'm trying to point out is that some of the things are technically done. And 